All right, now let's do some general overview uh, of some information on the Trinity debate. Here we have looked in, in previous uh, sections. We have looked at numerous sects to clearly state that God is one and that only the Father is God. We have looked at clear statements that Jesus is a man, but God is not a man. Jesus is the Son of Man, but God is not a Son of Man. Jesus was tempted, but God cannot be tempted. Jesus received life in himself from God. Jesus received authority from God. Jesus said that God was his God. Jesus said the Father was greater than him. God made Jesus um, both Christ and Lord. It was God's power working through Jesus which created all things. Jesus is not omniscient, but God is omniscient. Jesus died, but God cannot die. I don't feel the uh, arguments from silence are generally that good. However, there is one that is worth considering because it is... Uh, some very strong evidence supporting it. The foundation of Judaism is here is where the Lord our God is one Lord. I cannot stress enough how important this concept is to the oneness, how important the concept of the oneness of God is to Judaism. It is the very heart and foundation of Judaism. Uh, one thing we don't find in the New Testament is any records of the early church having any major, major controversies from declaring that God is three and that the man Jesus is God in the flesh. Now, it would be foolish to say that this debate had to have taken place, and therefore it didn't, um, because we have records of it. Um, therefore it didn't, because we have records of it, and therefore the apostles never pushed this idea. Uh, that'd be a very weak argument from silence. Acts chapter 15 gives a very insightful account on, into the development of the uh, doctrine of the early church. Most of the earliest followers of, Jesus, of the Jesus movement came from the Jewish community, and it was a sect within Judaism. When a Gentile accept, accepted Jesus, they were expected to be, get circumcised and follow all the laws of Moses and become Jewish. Paul, however, began to preach that the Gentile converts did not have to become Jewish in order to be part of the, of the believing community. He said that they only needed to accept Jesus to be considered believers. Uh, the debate over this nearly tore the church apart. Paul went to Jerusalem to lay the matter before the church leaders. James, Jesus' brother and the leader of the church, decided that Gentiles did not need to get circumcised and become Jews. He said they would be accepted even if, if they only abided by a few regulations. It is interesting to note, I should point out, as an interesting side note, I should point out that James was not saying that the laws of Moses had been done away with. He had uh, merely found a loophole in Judaism. Uh, the regulations that he said were sufficient for the Gentile believers as an early form of the Noahide laws. These are the laws that Judaism considers as binding on all humans, whereas the laws of Moses are only binding on Jews. In other words, even though Paul got them to accept these Gentile converts um, as believers without being circumcised, the uh, uh, church in Jerusalem did not consider the laws of Moses to, to have been done away with. They merely stated that um, these Gentile converts would only be required to abide by the Noahide laws, while the laws given to all humans, and would just simply not be required to become Jews. Uh, one of the big differences between Judaism and Christianity is Christians tend to have this idea that if you're not Christian, then you're in danger of not being saved. Uh, the Jews don't have that concept at all. Uh, to them, being a Jew is someone who follows the uh, the Torah, the laws of Moses. Um, the only people that are required to follow them, according to Judaism, is the Jews. Um, there's no requirement in Judaism for there's no belief in Judaism that you have to become a Jew in order to be saved. You only have to follow these laws, the Noahide laws, which are, is what James said, as long as these uh, Gentile converts follow these, then that's good enough. Um, so he wasn't changing the theology of the church in Jerusalem at all. Uh, it was just simply being less strict about certain things. The most significant part of this incident for our discussion is that it provides a direct evidence that the Jerusalem church was made up of dedicated Jews. 
They did not want to make any major changes to, to Judaism and challenged anything that they felt threatened their, their Jewish faith and way of life. If there was such an uproar over accepting uncircumcised members into the congregation, remember that being circumcised and becoming a Jew was not considered to be a, um, necessary for someone to be saved. Um, it was only necessary if they wanted to be part of the Jewish community. So if there's such an uproar over accepting uncircumcised members into the congreg congregation, why don't we see a similar uproar over preaching that there are three who are God and worse yet, we should worship a human being as God? We don't... This huge controversy over a fairly simple matter which didn't actually change the religion um, but we don't see any controversy at all over what would be a very fundamental change to the religion, which would be the Trinity. Acts chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, 42, contains another interesting incident that makes no sense if the apostles are preaching that the man Jesus is one of three beings who are God. In this story, the Jewish leaders arrested the apostles and wanted to kill them for preaching that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. But one Pharisee named uh, Gamaliel argued that they shouldn't be too hasty to kill the apostles. They should wait and see. Previous messianic movements had, brief, had been briefly successful, then withered and died. Gamaliel said they should wait and see what would happen, because if the Jesus movement was from God, then it would succeed. This is very significant, because it indicates that the Jewish leaders didn't see the apostles' teaching as being opposed to, Ju to Judaism itself. They were not preaching any fundamental change to Jewish theology. They conceded the possibility that it could have come from God. The thing to take away from this is why would they have de decided to wait and see what would happen if the apostles had broken any major laws of Judaism? Why wouldn't anyone at the council brought up the Trinity if the apostles had really been preaching it? If the apostles had been going on saying, Jesus is God and there are three persons who are God, that would have been a huge issue for the council here, but the, no one brought it up wasn't even discussed. How could the Jewish leaders have conceded the possibility that the apostles were led by God, even if they didn't really believe it, they were at least acknowledging, taking a somewhat agnostic approach, or Gamaliel was taking a somewhat agnostic approach to this for the time being, saying there's not beyond the realms of possibility, even though they didn't actually believe it. Um, so how could they have conceived the possibility that the apostles were led by God if the apostles were preaching that we should worship a human being as God and that there were three persons who were God? That would be a huge change to the Jewish theology. They wouldn't have simply said, let's wait and see about that. And again, we saw earlier, the, uh, even the Christian community, the Jewish Christian community in Jerusalem, they had a huge uproar over just whether someone had to become circumcised or not in order to be part of the community. If there was such a huge uproar over something like that, then uh, why don't we see something similar for this even bigger change, or to something that actually does change the basic theology of Judaism? Why don't we see that? When you watch presentations supporting the Trinity, you will see a clear pattern emerge. They will quote one or two passages of scripture and then present a long philosophical argument about how important the Trinity is and why God must be a Trinity. However, they don't present any clear scripture for most of their key points. They sound very good and wonderful, but they are based solely on human reasoning. Uh, here's one example. Trinitarians will often fall back on the argument that Jesus had to be God because a created being's life is not valuable enough to be punished for our sins. Uh, this sounds reasonable to many people, uh, at least if you've been brought up in Christianity, until you realize that the presenter simply asserts this they, and did not quote it from Scripture. The reason he did not quote it from Scripture is because there is not one verse in Scripture that clearly states this principle. They're just simply asserting it. It is their belief. They're not showing it from the Bible. You can't go to one verse and says this is where it says a created being cannot um, be punished for our sins. It just somebody doesn't say that. And actually, 
that even that very principle is flawed. What is the Bible's explanation? Uh, Romans chapter 5 verses 12 through 15. Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed unto all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin, sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over, over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him which it was to come. But as not as one offense, so also is the free gift. For if through one offense... For if through the offense of one many be dead, there much more by the grace of God and by the grace, gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So sin entered by one man, and grace entered by one man. Nothing here about Jesus had to be God for this. Nothing. If he even calls Jesus a man, and the same as Adam. In Hebrews chapter 7, verses 24 and 25, But this man again calling Jesus a man, because he continueth forever, so this is his the reason, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able to save them to the utmost unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He was here saying Jesus is able to save us, or save, because he lives forever, unlike the priests uh, in the earthly sanctuary. So the Bible actually gives an explanation here. It has nothing to do with Jesus being God. As you can see, the Bible's reasoning is fundamentally different. The Trinitarian argument that only an uncreated being could die for our sins uh, also assumes that the penal substitution theory is correct. This is a belief that God forgives our sins by punishing Jesus in our place. It is a form of satisfaction and atonement theory. There are a number of historians who argue that the satisfaction atonement theory was first fully expressed by Anselm in the 11th century, a thousand years after Christ. One of the earliest atonement theories is the moral influence theory. In the moral influence theory, the emphasis is on Jesus' life and teachings. Jesus is seen as living a perfect life of obedience to God from birth through a martyr's death in order to bring us closer to God. This view of the atonement is not tied to to the doctrine of the Trinity, and is generally seen as conflicting with the penal substitution theory. It is worth noting that the moral influence theory, in addition to one of the oldest theories, shares a lot of common traits with the Islamic view of Jesus. A very good book on this uh, a theory is, a moral, is a moral Transformation, the original uh, Christian paradigm of salvation by A.J. Wallace. Another the atonement theory that predates Anselm's satisfaction theory is a Christus Victor theory of atonement. In this theory, Jesus is not punished for our sins. Instead, Jesus defeats Satan and death through his death and resurrection and frees us from, the power in, from their power and influence. Gustav Allen's uh, book Christus Victor is the classic work in this theory. It also shows that the satisfaction theory, satisfaction and atonement theory, uh, did not become dominant until Anselm in the 11th century. The point of this little sidebar is to point out that not only is the penal substitu substitution theory of atonement not the only theory of atonement, but there is a good reason to believe that it is not what the New Testament writers had in mind. One cannot simply assert that Jesus had to be God in order to be punished in our place. One would first have to prove the penal substitution theory of atonement to be true. And I do not personally subscribe to that theory of atonement. Um, many Christians do not subscribe to the theory of atonement. Mainstream Muslims and Jews find the idea of God punishing an in innocent person for our sins completely unjust. Uh, the books I mentioned above go far, above go far into far more depth by arguing against the penal substitution theory than I can possibly cover here. Uh, this is a very brief summary of some of my reasons for not believing the penal substitution uh, atonement theory. There are two main sources the Protestants go to for evidence of the theory. The first is Paul's writings. Peter warns us that Paul's writings are very difficult to properly understand, and that many Christians, even in the days of the Apostles, misinterpreted what Paul wrote and created false doctrines. Peter says that the way to correctly interpret Paul is to first understand what Jesus taught. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 through 18 And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul 
also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that ye be not carried away with the error of the lawless people, and lose your own stability. But grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be the glory, both now and in the day of eternity. Amen. Paul's writings have a warning label in the Bible. Be careful. It is very easy to misinterpret these and create false doctrines to your own destruction. Don't base theology on Paul. They, Peter warns you, don't do that. Peter warns you, you uh, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of the lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Base theology and what Jesus taught. Search through Jesus' teachings and see what he teaches about salvation. Jesus consistently teaches that salvation comes to those who obey God, do well to others, and follow Jesus. You would be hard pressed to find even one instance where Jesus said we would be saved by believing that God punished him for our sins. You just take a look. Read through the Gospels, and just the Gospels. The second place the Protestants go to for evidence of the penal substitution theory of atonement is the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. They say that anyone who sinned uh, had to bring a sacrifice to the sanctuary, confess their sin over the animal, and kill it. And I used to wonder why Jesus, Jews didn't accept this as proof that Jesus died for our sins. Then I looked, studied and found out. Uh, Jesus would tell you that this kind of sacrifice was only for mistakes or unintentionally breaking the Mosaic Law. Deliberate intentional sins could not be forgiven this way. They say that Christians are reading their own preconceived ideas into the scripture and ignoring the context. They say that Christians aren't using proper exegesis, drawing the interpretation out of the text. They say that a person who has sinned deliberately couldn't be forgiven by bringing a sacrifice. They say that a deliberate sinner was forgiven by God by sincere repentance. They say that a repentant, deliberate sinner would bring a sacrifice as a gift to God after repenting and asking God forgiveness as a gift to God. Um, but they never placed their hands on the sacrifice and confessed their deliberate sins over the sacrifice, transferring their guilt to the, to the sacrifice. And they do say that there were other forms of fulfillment that did not involve sacrifice. Here are the verses they used to show this. Uh, Leviticus chapter 4 verses 2 through 5 uh, Speaking unto the children of Israel, saying, If anyone shall sin unwittingly in any of these things which Jehovah hath commanded not to be done, and shall do any one of them, if the atone anointed priest shall sin so as to bring guilt on his people, then let him offer for his sin which he has sinned, a young bullock, without blemish unto Jehovah for his sin offering. And he shall bring the bullock unto the door of the tent meeting, um, before Jehovah, shall lay his hands on the head of the bullock and kill the bullock before Jehovah, and the anointed priest shall uh, take of the blood of the bullock and bring it to the tent meeting, tent of meeting. And con continuing in verse thirteen, and if the whole congregation of Israel err and the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly, they, they don't realize it at first what they've done, and they have done any of the things. Uh, which Jehovah has set, commanded not to be done, and are guilty. When the sin wherein they have sinned is known, then the assembly shall offer a young bullock for a sound offering, bring it before the tent of meeting, and the elders of the congregation lay, shall lay their hands upon the head of the, the bullock before Jehovah, and the bullock shall be killed before Jehovah, and the anointed priest shall bring of the blood of the bullock to the tent, tent meeting. And then continuing verse 22. Uh, when a ruler sinneth and doeth unwittingly any one of the things which Jehovah his God hath commanded not to be done, and is guilty, if his sin wherein he has sinned be made known to him, in other words, you didn't know before, it was an accident, he shall bring for his oblation a goat, a male without blemish, and he shall lay his hands on the head of the goat and kill it in the place where they killed the burnt offering before Jehovah. It is a sin offering. And the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put 
it upon the horns of the altar before the bur of the burnt offering, and the blood thereof shall he pour out at the base of the altar of the burnt offering. In verse 27, And if any one of the common people sin unwittingly in doing any of the things Jehovah hath commanded not to be done, and be guilty, if his sin which he sin hath sinned be made known to him, whereas he didn't know it before, then shall he bring for his oblation a goat, a female without blemish, for a sin which he hath sinned. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering, and kill the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. And the priest shall take of the blood with his finger, and put it on the horns of the altar of the burnt offering. And all, all the blood thereof shall he pour out at the base of the altar. And all the fat thereof shall he take away, as the fat is taken away off the sacrifice of the peace offerings. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savour unto Jehovah. And the priest shall make atonement for him, and he shall be forgiven. And if he bring a lamb at his, as his oblation for a sin offering, he shall make it a female without blemish. And they shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering, and kill it for a sin offering, the place where they kill the burnt offering. Then in chapter 5, If any one sin, and that he hears, uh, the voice of adjuration, he being a witness, wherein he hath seen or known, if he uh, do not utter it, then shall he bear his iniquity. In other words, oh, uh, and let's read in, verse, in the English Standard Version, it's a little bit easier to understand. If anyone sins in the hears a public adjuration to testify, and though he is a witness, wherein he has seen or come to know the matter, yea, he does not speak, he shall bear his iniquity. Then continue on in verse 2. Uh, or if any one touch any unclean thing, wherein it be a carcass of an unclean beast, or the carcass of an unclean cattle, or the carcass of an unclean creeping thing, and it be hidden from him, and he be unclean, then shall he be guilty. Or if any one touch the uncleanness of man, wherein whosoever is uncleanness shall be worthy, wherein, wherewith he is unclean, and it shall be hid from him. When he knoweth it, then he, then he shall be guilty. And if anyone swear rashly, you're not, it's, uh, act of the moment, with his lips to do evil, or to do good, whatsoever it be, the man shall utter rashly with an oath, and it be hid from him. When he knoweth it, then he, then shall he, then he shall be guilty of one of these things. And it shall be when he hath, uh, shall be guilty in one of these things, the, these very specific things, then he shall confess that wherein he hath sinned. And I shall bring the trespass offering unto Jehovah for sin, which he sinned, a female from a flock, a lamb or a goat, for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for him as concerning his sin. Notice it's consistently, consistently a female. It's not, which we inconsistent if it's a symbol of Jesus. And if uh, <coughs> his means suffice not for a lamb, then he shall bring it for a trespass offering, uh, for that wherein he hath sinned, two turtle doves, uh, or two young pigeons, unto Jehovah, one for a sin offering, the other for a burnt offering. And he shall bring them unto the priest, who shall offer that which is for the sin offering first, and wring off its head from its neck, but he shall not divide it asunder. And he shall sprinkle out the blood of the sin offering upon the side of the altar, and the rest of the blood shall be drained out at the base of the altar. It is the sin offering. And he shall offer the second for a burnt offering, according to the ordinance, and the priest shall make an atonement for him as concerning his sin which he has sinned, and he shall be forgiven. Again, this is just for those things listed. It's not general sins. But if his means suffice not for two turtle doves or two young pigeon, pigeons, then he shall bring for his oblation that wherein he hath sinned a tenth of an ephah of fine flour for sin offering. He shall put no oil on it, neither shall he put any frankincense therein, for it is a sin. And I shall bring it to the priest, and the priest shall take the handful of it as a memorial thereof, and burn it on the altar upon the offerings of Jehovah made by fire. It is a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him as touching his sin, that he has sinned in any of these things, the things listed there, just those specific things. And he shall be forgiven, and the permanent shall be the priest as a meal offering. And Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, If anyone commit a trespass, and sin unwittingly, again, it's specifying unwittingly in the holy things of Jehovah. Then he shall bring his trespass offering unto Jehovah, a ram, 
without blemish out of the flock according to thy estimation of it in silver by shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary for a trespass offering. And he shall make restitution for that which he hath done amiss in the holy thing, and shall add the fifth part thereto, and give it unto the priest, and the priest shall make atonement of ram out with the ram of the trespass offering, and he shall be forgiven. And if any one sin, and do any of the things which, things which Jehovah commanded not to be done, though he knew it not, it's an accident, yet he is guilty, and shall bear his iniquity. And he shall bring a ram without blemish out of the flock, and according to thy estimation, for trespass offering unto the priest, and the priest uh, shall make atonement for him concerning the things wherein he erred unwittingly and knew it not. And he shall be forgiven. And in Numbers chapter 15, verse 22 through 30. And if ye have erred and not observed all of these commandments which the Lord hath spoken unto Moses, it's an error. Even all that the Lord has commanded you by the hand of Moses from the day of the Lord God commanded Moses, and henceforward among your generations, then it shall be, if ought to be committed by ignorance, without the knowledge of the congregation, that all the congregation shall offer one bullock for a burnt offering, for a sweet savor unto the Lord, with his meat offering and his drink offering, according to the manner, and one kind of his goat for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for the congregation of the children of Israel, and it shall be forgiven for them, for it is ignorance. And they shall bring their offering a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord, and their sin offering before the Lord for their ignorance. And it shall be forgiven all the congregation of the children of Israel, and the stranger that sojourneth among them, seeing all the people were in ignorance. And if any soul sin through ignorance, he shall bring the she-goat of the first year for sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for a soul that sinneth ignorantly. When he sinneth by ignorance before the Lord to make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. Yet shall uh, one law, he shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance, both for him that is born in the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. But the soul that sinneth doeth uh, presumptuously. You're purposely sinning, you're actually doing real sin. It's not an accident. Whether he born in the land or the stranger, the same reproach of the Lord, thou soul shall be cut off from among his people. It doesn't say he shall bring a sin offering and confess over it and uh, kill it and such. No. It's if you do this on purpose, you be cut off from among the people. All through those descriptions of the sacrifices where you committed sin and you can bring the animal to the sanctuary and confess over it and kill it and so all of those descriptions were consistently saying these are for accidents these are for ignorance um, errors things like that and it specifies in here if you do all presumptuously if purposely sin n not an accident then you're cut off from the people you don't bring that sacrifice the Christians completely made this up that the idea that um, any time someone sinned, they would bring a sacrifice for any sin and confess their sin over it and kill it and they'd be forgiven. That's something made up by the Christians. It's not in the Torah. It's just simply not there. If you actually read those verses in the context, you'll see that they do not say that. Because those sacrifices are just for accidents, things done through ignorance, um, and stuff like that. Proverbs 15.8 The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Proverbs 21.27 The sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. How much more when he bringeth it with a wicked mind. Psalm 46 Sacrifice and offering dost thou not desire. Mine ears hast thou, not, hast thou opened. But burnt offering and sin offering hast thou, not, hast thou not required. If you purposely sin, it would actually be an abomination for you to bring that sacrifice. And it is, you're not required to bring it. Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. If you sin purposely, 
You are not required to bring that sacrifice. You are required to repent. That is the only way you can make things right with God. The sacrifices of God are broken spirit. And if someone did commit a purposeful sin and bring one of those sacrifices and try to confess their sin over it and kill it and such, it would be an abomination. They are actually forbidden to do that. Isaiah chapter 1 verses 11 to 19 To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of burnt offerings of rams, and the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks, or of lambs, or of he goats. When if ye appear unto me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons and the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it is iniquity, even solemn meaning. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you and we ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make your when ye make many uh, prayers, I will not hear your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean, put away evil from your doings before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. So if you're doing evil these things will not help you. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though you sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. So purposeful sins, the solution to those was turning away from them. It is not bringing sacrifices. Amos 5, 22-24 Though ye offer me burnt offerings and meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. But let judgment rain down as waters, and righteousness as a mighty stream. Micah 6, 6-8 Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? The calves of your old, you know, it's, it's asking the prophet is saying, If I commit a sin, should I bring if I purposely sin, commit a real sin, uh, should I come to him with burnt offerings? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath shown thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Penal substitution theory claims that, no atonement, that there is no atonement without sacrifice. Here are examples of atonement without sacrifice. Numbers 16, verses 47. And Aaron took, as Moses commanded, and ran in the midst of the congregation. And behold, a plague was among the people, and he put on incense. He made an atonement for the people. He made atonement through incense. Numbers 3150. We have therefore brought an oblation before the Lord, what every man hath gotten, of jewels, gold, chains, and bracelets, rings, and earrings, and tablets, to make an atonement for their, our souls before the Lord. They made atonement by giving gifts to God by, through offerings. Isaiah 6, 6-7 Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live pole in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it on my mouth, and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, thy sin purged. Not a sacrifice. James 5, 19-20 Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save us all from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. 1 Peter 4, 8 And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Please read the scriptures. If you want to understand atonement, get it from the scriptures, not from the preachers.